ओके अमरा अमरा कौन लाइव है आशीष सर आप प्लीज स्टार्ट करों गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम बैक इन द सेकंड डे ऑफ आवर टू डेज नेशनल वेबिनार ऑन लाइफ इन द यूनिवर्स एंड डाइवर्सिटी ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बॉटनी इन कोलैबोरेशन विद आईक्यूएसी डानाकट कॉलेज डानाकट में आई होप that all of us now not only that enrich ourselves so the yesterday's delicious lecture given by dr dp duwari and dr nobin kumar dhol but is it also help us to some to some extent to think over the new arena of research for our younger generations i hope that in the first day of this webinar we cherish the feeling of the togetherness during this period of covid pandemic situations where all the direct teaching and the learning process is in freezing conditions today in the second day of our national webinar we are going to enjoy lecture of two eminent scientists from the field of plant science and they enlighten us by spreading light of their research findings it's my strong belief that all of us eagerly waiting for their lecture so i would like to increase this their anxiousness by using more of my words i welcome again to all of you to enjoy today's delicious lecture delivered by dr neera shinsharkar and dr basant kumar singh thereafter but before starting our technical session i just would like to mention two things that two orthographic errors human errors it's better to say orthographic human errors <laughs> which occurred in our brochure especially in concerned with our two speakers of today's two speakers that is spelling of surname of basant kumar singh is unfortunately typed wrongly there one h is absent his surname spelling is s i n g h unfortunately it is printed on the brochure as s i n g we are sorry for that and second the designation of our respected madam dr neera shin sarkar has been falsely printed there wrongly printed there better to say uh, she is now in the position of assistant professor in the department of botany university of kolani but unfortunately an orthographic error occurred there and her designation was printed there as associate professor in botany department of botany we are sorry for that now we entered in today's technical sessions of the webinar and first lecture will be delivered by dr neera shin sarkar assistant professor in botany of university of kolani and her topic of lecture is life and thereafter i convey my sincere thanks to dr shin sarkar an eminent indian algologist with international fame for accepting our invitations to deliver her valuable lecture in spite of our busy schedule hope all of you enjoy her lecture before our lecture i request my colleague mrs kinki tikadar to introduce our honorable speaker mrs tikadar please thank you dr sunit mitra a very good evening to all of you and thank you for being with us It's my privilege to introduce our speaker, Dr. Neera Shain Sharkar, who is an assistant professor in Department of Botany at University of Kalyani. She obtained her PhD degree in science, botany, from University of Calcutta. She also holds a postgraduate diploma in intellectual property rights. She has worked with the West Bengal Biodiversity Board, and she has about 24 years of research experience in specific fields. and her areas of expertise include 
algae of sundarban mangroves ecology biodiversity conservation and intellectual property rights she has authored one book named by algal flora of sundarban mangal and co-authored a number of book chapter along with about 33 international and national journal publication she is also a recipient of the first track young scientist award from the science and engineering research board she has acted as the nominated algae expert of the worldwide fund for nature she has been a trainer of government official of west bengal in biodiversity conservation and she has been an expert in the consultative workshop on alignment of national action program on combating desertification organized by the indian council of forest research and education dehradun she has taken a great initi initiative to successfully establish a biodiversity park in kolani university premises with special attention to butterflies medicinal plants and arboretum it's a real honor to have her with us today she will be sharing her expert opinion on a topic entitled by life and thereafter now i request you all to pay attention to dr neera shen sharkar and dr neera shen sharkar please okay a very good evening to all the participants of this two day uh, national seminar webinar rather Uh, first of all i wish to thank the organizing committee of the uh, ranaghat college for this webinar uh, principal sir dr arup kumar maithi uh, dr shunith uh, mitra the head of the department and convener of this seminar other faculties of the department of botany dr bibekanand mukherjee dr dhruv dash along with uh, mr bishwajit dash and shrimati pinky tikadar the last two mentions also happen to be my students which is always a pleasure and uh, members of the iqac cell of the college for having given me this opportunity to speak in this very interestingly titled webinar life in the universe and diversity uh, which seeks to throw light on life amidst all this darkness around us and on biodiversity which has an always Uh, continue to sustain life <clears throat> i think i shall start from where dr uh, devi prashad duari left yesterday uh, it is always a pleasure to uh, hear dr duari speak on varied aspects of life in the universe and i'm sure his extremely lucid explanation and uh, vivid presentation on the earth's timeline and how it's looked habitable for existence of life is still imprinted in the minds of the participants so with the understanding that life has finally arrived on the face of this earth since yesterday evening i shall dwell upon what happened thereafter and uh, that is how i have named my topic of discussion today i need just a few moments to start sharing my slides with you i've not been given the uh, okay ma'am okay sorry status. yeah 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 thank you yeah it's yeah. visible okay. so uh, here we are life and thereafter and uh, before i proceed i need to take into consideration uh, the background of the enthusiastic participants of this webinar i found them very enthusiastic yesterday with lots of comments coming in when i was uh, listening to dr duwari also and i got to know that i have an audience belonging to many different spheres of study and with uh, backgrounds that may not necessarily be botany alone so i've tried to keep a general approach to the discussion today and do away with uh, most of the technical jargon so that it becomes an issue that uh, concerns everyone and with the, which everyone can relate so uh, well 
this is in a nutshell the most significant evolutionary events since the earth came into existence so what we will be doing right now is basically see in a jiffy what happened chronologically in about 4.6 billion years of the history of our earth so after the formation of the earth water is said to have appeared on earth about 4.4 billion years ago uh, 2019 paper in nature astronomy attributes this emergence to the giant impact of the earth with theia that led to the formation of the moon and also brought along water and carbon based material with it uh, at about uh, 4 to 3.5 billion years ago the microbial world or the microbial life started and by the time the earth was about 3.5 billion years uh, ago it was already getting oxygenated to an extent which ensured that life would thrive on this planet uh, after being witness to many uh, arrivals and departures of life forms through a span of another 1 billion years about 2.4 billion years ago the earth saw the dinosaurs step in the mammals arrived at about 2 billion years ago and the flowering plants 1.8 billion years ago finally just 0.2 million years ago we as in our prehistoric ancestors arrived uh this is something that i've always found very interesting and amusing since i saw it many years ago so i thought that uh, i would be sharing this with my young enthusiastic participants it is basically the arrival history of different life forms in the 4.6 billion year history of the earth while imagining the whole time span to be about 24 hours or just one day uh, uh Uh, just the, the the arrival sequence of different organisms on the face of this earth have been depicted it's a very interesting way of showing things and i thought of show, uh, sharing it with you so at 12 am the earth was created first life appeared only at about 4 am followed by emergence of organisms capacitated to perform photosynthesis at about 5:30 am and then again it took about 8 hours for the first eukaryotic life forms to appear that would be around 1 pm then another period of silence and about 4 and a half hours later the first multicellular life appeared on earth the first simple animals arrived about 3 and a half hours later at 9 pm with the onset of the very important cambrian explosion within 9.27 pm mollusks and arthropods were teeming the sea yes the seas are the first places where the life you know started teeming at about 9.41 pm the first land plants appeared followed by an invasion of land by the coal age swarms amphibians insects and that was at about uh, 10.7 pm at 10.26 pm the reptiles appeared 10.41 the dinosaurs came in and this period corresponds with the triassic they dominated throughout the next period also that is the jurassic and in the cretaceous by about 11:14 pm the dinosaurs had left forever the first mammal had also appeared by that time that was approximately at 11.39 pm and with the departure of the dinosaurs their competition was reduced significantly and of course naturally they started dominating with the climate also changing to the favor of their survival uh, they kind of took over the land now you must be wondering that the day is nearly over and when do we arrive Yes, our earliest known ancestors, the hominids, arrived just in time to save the day for us, and that was at about eleven fifty-eight p.m. The cooling period started just a minute after that, the major ice age, and just in the nick of time, modern humans arrived at eleven fifty-nine fifty-nine. To stay, 
to change, to alter and destruct a planet that was not even theirs for ages together. That is the irony of this story. Uh, well, this is basically a beautiful illustrative representation by an American artist, Ray Troll, that speaks of all the time periods and eras that our Earth has been, which has been subjected to or has witnessed in its 4.6 billion history. There's a lot of technical jargon inside this, and I think I would avoid that because I'll be talking about things that happen much later. So what I'll be talking about, there are broadly three parts of the story. And since talking about the Earth is mostly about how we perceive it, the anthropocentric view is bound to come. Hence, the story revolves around us. The first part of the story is about the Earth when we had not arrived. The second part announces our arrival. And the third, what we did thereafter. The most important part of this discussion relates to the arrivals and departures of life forms. Since we have already delved upon the arrivals, now on we'll be talking about extinctions. Extinctions as we have uh, known, uh, as we know that it has always existed. Right since George Cuvier showed in the late 1700s that fossils were not from living yet undiscovered creatures as was thought in those times, but from lost species. Further down, Charles Lyell and Sir Charles Darwin put forth the idea that Earth's processes like geology, evolution and even extinction occur very, very, very slowly. So slowly that we never actually see them happening. The idea of catastrophic extinction was not popular at that time. It was only after uh, 1980s that the idea of catastrophic disappearance of organisms from the face of this earth began to settle down as a probability. The works of Walter Alvarez and his Nobel winning father, Louis Alvarez, set the momentum for comprehending the concept of mass ex extinction. As is with all theories, when they are first presented, Alvarez's hypothesis too became controversial. But with the discovery of the Chicxulab crater in Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, things began to settle down. And with that came acceptance. Acceptance for what? Acceptance for a theory which started with the observation regarding sudden disappearance of tiny organisms called ammonites with between two rock layers from the Earth's crust and which also corresponded with the age of the last dinosaurs. And, the hypo and uh, hypo they hypothesized, that uh, the, the father and son duo hypothesized the occurrence of a catastrophic event about 66 million years ago, the period when the dinosaurs also disappeared. And they uncoated this message in the Earth's crust. And what did they find? A very interesting finding. They found significantly high levels of iridium, which is not so common in the Earth's crust, but can be abundant in asteroids. So the hypothesis they put forth was that a huge asteroid had struck the Earth at the time which marks the end of the Mesozoic era and had wiped out about 75% of the species on Earth. So as life continued, even before we came in, the wheel of extinction moved along. And with millions of species alive today, we can also talk of billions of species which have become extinct. And if all the available fossil records are taken together, we'll see that uh, about 98% of the species that have ever lived on this earth are no longer alive. So we now know that the earth has seen five mass extinction events in its lifetime. And each time, a majority of the species on Earth disappeared in the blink of a geological event. 
and these mass extinctions include the Ordovician Silurian that happened about 450 million years ago, the late Devonian which occurred about 365 million years ago, the end Permian about 250 million years ago and this was perhaps the most expansive and most destructive in nature and it wiped out about 96% of the existing species. This was followed by the Triassic, Jurassic extinction about 200 million years ago. And the last one, the one that the Alvarez put forth their theory for, that is the Cretaceous Paleogene about 66 million years ago. With all the information we have about all such extinctions, we now know that extinctions have happened even before we came to exist. But never, never on such a steady rate as we are witnessing right now. And when we did come in, we decided to do things our way. Uh, a look at how the extinctions uh, have been generally occurring before we came in, it would be something like this. Putting it on a very simple way, uh, if we talk about just the mammals and the amphibians, it is around uh, one extinction of mammals in 700 years and one extinction of, a, of an amphibian in 1000 years. But what have we done? We have taken this to 1000 extinctions of mammals per 700 years and 4, 45,000 extinctions of amphibians in just 1,000 years. So we have paved way for the sixth extinction. Not only we have paved way, we are presently into the sixth extinction and we don't need an asteroid to wipe out our coexistent species. We are, our, our actions are capable enough. Uh, in this context, I present a book, The Sixth Extinction, An Unnatural History, which was the winner of 2015 Pulitzer Prize for Nonfiction. It's a very timely, very meticulously researched and well-written book by Elizabeth Colbert, who is basically a science journalist. And uh, she's a very famous writer. And uh, the book is an excellent representation of all the all the unnoticed maybe uh, extinctions that have happened in just a few years back in the present day situations and it talks about how we as humans have changed the total scenario of the earth so we are in the midst of the earth's sixth mass extinction crisis and mind it it's not that we are starting on it, we are already into it. <coughs> Sorry. And so even if we find things going around us pretty well, pretty organized and apparently without anything to worry about, we need to remember that there is a background rate of extinction growing steadily. It's growing steadily day after day, month after month and year after year. Uh, E.O. Wilson, a, a, a very noted ecologist, a very noted biodiversity conservation scientist. I don't need to, uh, you know, introduce Wilson to people from biology background, but still, since people from all uh, of the spheres of studies are here, so I just spoke about it in a few words. He gave an estimate that 30,000 species per year or three species per hour are being driven to extinction. And the, the graph that I showed in just a few slides back, if you compare this with that natural background rate of one extinction per million species per year, you can see why scientists refer to it as a crisis unparalleled in human history. The current mass extinction differs from all other mass extinctions in being driven by a single species rather than being a planetary or a galactic physical process. And there are, there are no prizes for guessing 
which single species I'm talking about. So when the human race, Homo sapiens sapiens, migrated out of Africa to the Middle East 90,000 years ago, to Europe and Australia about 40,000 years ago, and to North America about uh, 12,500 years ago, to the Caribbean 8,000 years ago, waves of extinction soon followed. The colonization followed by extinction pattern can be seen as recently as 2000 years ago when humans colonized Madagascar and quickly drove away the elephant, birds, hippos and large lemurs extinct. So when did the first wave of extinction start? The first wave of extinction targeted the large vertebrates. And by whom? They were, the hunt, they were hunted down by the hunter-gatherers. The second larger wave began about 10,000 years ago as the discovery of agriculture caused a population boom and a need to plow wildlife habitats, divert streams and maintain large herds of domestic cattle became inevitable for the uh, being civilized human population. The third and the largest wave of destruction began in the 1800s with the harnessing of fossil fuels. No population of a large vertebrate animal in the history of this planet has grown this much, this fast, and with such devastating consequences on its fellow earthings. Human impact has been so profound that scientists have proposed that the Holocene era be declared as the Anthropocene, the age when the global environmental effects of increased human population and economic development dominate planetary, physical, chemical and biological conditions. Now moving on, uh, this is a study which has used the IUCN evaluated species. So there is no uh, no conditions or no talking about situations where overestimates have been done or underestimates have been done, which is always the, 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 the idea that is put forth that there is so much of species, there is so much of unknown species, that there is always a, the, the chances of being uh, underestimations or overestimations. No, this graph is... 100% IUCN evaluated species and look at the cumulative extinctions against the background. This is the background line and look at this against, uh, if, if this is looked against the extinction rate of other vertebrates, of vertebrates, of birds, of mammals, then if climate change is real, I wouldn't say if climate change is real, and so is the sixth extinction. Now, uh, that was the kind of uh, uh, understanding that I would stop at when I am talking about life thereafter. Why I would like to stop over here is because I want to do a fast forward. A kind of fast forward that takes us to a situation which we all find ourselves amidst, not in a single country, not uh, confined to a single geographical location, not confined to a single uh, climatic zone, but to the whole of this earth. Just like things happen in case of the mass extinctions, just like it happens in case of the sixth extinction that we are going through, the corona pandemic has also a similar widespread effect. And since we have been pushed into a situation amidst our, you know, uh, trying to move towards the sixth extinction, we have been put into a situation which demands more thinking, more contemplation. And I thought of contemplating it or discussing this in terms of biodiversity. Corona pandemic has many effects. It has socioeconomic, political, regional, health effects. It has innumerable effects on the human being and it will continue to show this effect for years to come maybe. It also has effect on biodiversity or rather uh, we could say that 
both have effects on each other. And the issues that I found were common to both the linked topics of discussion were how the pandemic have affected biodiversity during its time of buildup and spread and what could be expected in the post-COVID situation. The two most important issues that crossed my mind were a major setback for policies and programs and secondly regarding funds for conservation. Along with this, uh, the forced ban on uh, you know, wildlife trade has probably shown its effect on wildlife crime also all over the world. Both the pandemic and biodiversity have had their influence in the genesis and spread of this novel corona outbreak. Anthropogenic pressures on the biodiversity have never been so aggressively made responsible, aggressively made responsible for human perils and deaths due to this pandemic, never before. But the disease has left the earth to detoxify itself which has been observed categorically in terms of increased wildlife visibility, recovery of ecosystems, decreased global emissions all over the world, making noteworthy differences to the air and water quality around us. And finally, nature coming to the aid of mankind by offering solutions for combating the disease from its repository of biodiversity well. Uh, I wouldn't be able to discuss all of it because of the, because of the time-related uh, issues, but I will probably handle a few of them. The most important that I found were the policies and programs, and I'll be talking about that. Uh, the year 2020 was a much-awaited year in terms of the biodiversity enthusiasts. The year actually marks the final year of the United Nations Decade on Biodiversity a program that was initiated in 2011 to promote the implementation of a strategic plan on biodiversity and its overall uh, vision of living in harmony with nature. And it was very famously named as the Aichi Biodiversity Targets. Now, what are these Aichi Biodiversity Targets? These are actually 20 strategically planned targets at the global and national levels. And 2020 had a series of programs scheduled for discussions and planning, the most important being the preparation of post-2020, like this, this decade ends in 2020. And so a preparation of post-2020 global biodiversity framework was you know, scheduled. The United Nations Environment Program, the UNEP, had also declared 2020 as the super year for nature. And a number of related international meetings and conferences stand cancelled or indefinitely postponed due to this pandemic. The International Biological Diversity Day, the theme this year was Solutions Are in Nature. What a meaningful theme, especially in the times that we live now. With the lockdown in place, the celebrations were dampened uh, for sure in execution, but definitely not in spirit. The World Environment Day, the theme being celebrate biodiversity, that too in congruence with the United Nations program, of course. And now a look at uh, just a few of the major international meets that have been disrupted due to this pandemic. The World Conservation Congress of the IUCN, scheduled to be held in France during June 2020, has been postponed to January 2021. The Environmental Agenda for 2020, marking the end of the United Nations Decade on Biodiversity, was scheduled to be held in Kunming in China, along with the Convention on Biological Diversity's 15th COP, that is the Conference of Parties, during October 2020. And this has also been postponed for an indefinite period. The very important meeting of the open-ended working group to decide on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework that I was talking about in the last slide. It was scheduled to be held in Colombia. That has been postponed. The United Nations Forum of uh, Forum of Forest and Ocean Conference uh, also stand delayed. They were supposed to be held in May 2020 and June 2020. They have also been postponed indefinitely. And uh, discussions delayed shall now show their repercussions in days and years to come. 
it is extremely important to not only understand but also remember all the time as our conscience would remind us that the food we eat the air we breathe the water we drink the climate that makes our planet habitable all come from nature and now that we live in exceptional times nature is sending us an important message what is the message that we are on the verge of a breakdown verge of a breakdown and that it's time to wake up to take notice and to reinstate our relationship with nature unfortunately we have been held back with all these delays and the disruptions to follow the norms of the pandemic that is social distancing this webinar being an example of that uh next uh we could talk about the uh, another issue that i was saying that i found very important in terms of biodiversity conservation combating uh, uh, species loss uh, taking steps towards understanding the sixth extinction taking steps towards uh, negating the effects of the sixth extinction which is happening effects of climate change etc uh it is the availability for funds for conservation purpose uh <clears throat> in terms of fund to be expected as available for conservation of biodiversity and the multitude of research that is extremely needed in present times we will be falling short why because it is obvious that with human health and containment of this novel corona virus research is on high priority and that's that's for sure it's it's needed a setback to research on biodiversity conservation can definitely be hypothesized so uh, uh, added to this is the total collapse of ecotourism provisions which has been a major revenue generating avenue for wildlife conservation habitat restoration in the past and for some, for the for, for all the concerned ministry and state departments uh, dr singh will be talking about uh, conservation in terms of uh, these issues also i presume and the fund crunch that comes in place furthermore the inevitable global economic recession that we are already started witnessing shall leave the governments and the conservation bodies bereft of funds that could be utilized for conservation and research on biodiversity so we are most likely to have an economic turmoil and social changes all over the world post this pandemic period and we are also at loss to understand how these changes are going to change the way things were planned to be done earlier and it goes without saying that the pandemic has totally disrupted conservation work and fundings and with potential repercussions for years to come this is going to continue unless and until we realize the importance of conservation in 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 every aspect of human existence now uh, i've been talking in uh, in slightly vague terms about conservation budgets Uh, this is just a uh, uh, data from the uh, annual reports of the ministry of environment and forest to show you the budgets that are uh, kept for conservation issues at national level and also another slide to show you at uh, our state level in west bengal so this one uh, is a, a, a this uh, one is the yearly budget for conservation activities through centrally sponsored schemes of the ministry of environment and forest and climate change it includes uh, many conservation programs like green india mission forest fire prevention and management project tiger project elephant de development of wildlife habitats biodiversity conservation conservation of aquatic ecosystems etc uh, these are all that the ministry transfers uh, to different states and union territories now the budget you can see uh, shows over here it includes the actual budget of 2018-19 the proposed and revised budgets of this is the proposed and the revised budget of 2019-20 uh, 2019 and 2020 and the proposed budget of 2021 the revenue column is shown in green color and uh, you can see that it contributes the lion's share to the total budget that is set 
aside for conservation purpose and this is going to experience a severe setback more so with all the ecotourism activities shelved for the time being and with an uncertainty of an unknown period to get an idea of about how uh, the uh, you know the revenue is in terms of uh, ecotourism activities uh, the unit wise revenue collected by the directorate of forest government of west bengal during four consecutive financial years starting from 2015 16 to 2018 19 have been shown the graph is uh, basically a percentage wise representation of revenue earning activities and the uh, um, place that shows others that is the red zone is basically what is contributed by ecotourism so in all spheres you will find that this part is definitely not going to be available for conservation purposes the next issue that i'll be dealing with is uh, the effect of pandemic on biodiversity uh, it's of course a very serious one and deals with the cause and spread of the pandemic and its consequence that again adversely affects biodiversity now illegal wildlife trafficking practices have resulted in emergence of zoonotic diseases as we all know the covid is a zoonotic disease which means that pathogens jump from one species to a different one such actions like these uh, you know these uh, illegal wildlife trafficking practices are primarily undertaken uh, with the intentions of bushmeat consumption uh, and uh, you know keeping unconventional exotic pets uh, making animal skin trophies accessories keeping home trophy decorations uh, owning uh, you know privately owned zoos traditional medicinal practices and many such desires of mankind which amount to greed and overconsumption and that can be done away with the corona pandemic has you know emerged as one of the worst zoonotic diseases of the recent times and it has taken the whole world in its grip and with the realization of the same being a zoonotic disease the acting executive secretary of the united nation convention on biological diversity has called for a global ban on wildlife markets to prevent and control future pandemics now with such a forced ban on wildlife trade in action uh, all over the world there has been a spike in wildlife crime this is very interesting like uh, uh, we have come to do in social sciences that there has been a deterioration in crime whatsoever during this pandemic but in terms of wildlife crime there has been a spike and the rate of such crime has increased manifold so wildlife trade both legal and illegal are reasons for concern in the context of zoonotic pandemics so their genesis spread intensity all depend on such wildlife trade and with that uh, being curbed the crime rises so you know it it puts us into a very vicious kind of a cycle uh, as to how to control have control over both trade and both the crime incidents related to wildlife uh, a report this is a report by the wildlife conservation society and uh, it's based on media reports it gives a overview of wildlife crime in the indian states uh, during a very small lockdown period this is uh, a slightly older uh, data uh, i just had the opportunity of looking into uh, a very new data by traffic a very new publication by traffic uh, which also talks about wildlife crime in the total uh, pandemic situation and that gives a better picture better idea of how uh, wildlife crime has grown manifold during this lockdown period so just looking into these uh, th this small uh, depiction of wildlife crime uh, which is april 13 to 30th uh, 2020 within a span of this 16 days 13 states recorded 25 cases of wildlife crime and uh, if you if we just look into uh, the uh, wildlife crimes that happened just a year before uh, we'll find that there has been uh an increase of 
2.6% over this just 16 days of uh, assessment. Now, this is a map of the illicit trade report of the World Customs Organization, which shows the trade routes of illegal wildlife trade around the world. How much time do I have? Let me see. I just have six more minutes, I presume. Okay. Uh, the uh, perspective of traffic also, I was talking about traffic right now. Uh, it, uh, it is also given over here. And look at the trade, the amount of trade in wildlife that happens all over the world. And imagine if all of this, you know, is put under a ban, what will happen uh, to the trade facilities, though illegal, though illegal. So traffic uh, basically talks about uh, the trade uh, related analysis of flora, fauna and flora in commerce. And uh, it is a bureau under the United Nations Environment Program. It works globally on trade in wild animals and plants. And it, uh, you know, kind of supports, it says that it supports and encourages tough emergency measures to regulate wildlife trade to reduce zoonotic disease risk. It also believes in introducing development and implementation of management tools to enhance traceability, certification, monitoring of wildlife trade. And it also suggests strengthened legislation and regulations for controlling import, export, sale, consumption, and many more other related aspects that concern human consumption from wild animals. Now, just like the pandemic came upon us as a nature's fury, so does nature hold solutions too for the same. And I shall be discussing this in my next issue, which is uh, we have you know finally come to the last part. Uh, this is about drug discovery research, and it emphasizes that solutions are in nature, or solution is in nature. So biodiversity is a natural repository for most medicines that we develop. As per estimates by the World Economic Forum, over 50% of modern drugs are developed from natural plant extracts. So clearly, biodiversity is essential not only for the ecosphere, but also for human health and medicine. And natural world contains pathogens. These pathogens are uh, in ecosyst ecosystemic stability. And uh, we humans have disturbed the stability. This, you know, disturbing the stability has uh repercussions in the smallest of spheres to the largest of spheres like uh, stability in a small ecosystem right starting right from there to the sixth extinction that i was talking about and uh, now with millions of people quarantined talking you know getting back to drug discovery now with millions of people uh, who are quarantined after lockdown and still people getting infected in thousands and the situation getting worse day by day it is absolutely imperative that a single or a multiple drug for treatment and vaccine be discovered and the urgency of research concerning finding a suitable candidate for drug dis development and vaccine discovery has grown in leaps and bounds. And the last few months have so seen so many screening and simulation experiments with plants uh, with the idea of developing new drugs and vaccines. And the most uh, convincing uh, vaccine candidates uh, from the plant world that have come up are Videnia somnifera, Artemisia annua, aloe vera, neem, and it gives me uh, immense pleasure to mention that except for, uh, you know, a few of the others, uh, the Kalani University Herbal Garden has a repository of all these plants mentioned over here. It is also heartening to note that the CSIR has, you know, approved the DGC, has received the approval for from the DGCI for two clinical trials. One is already underway. We all know about that. And, uh, uh, not dwelling into the details of these uh, discussions anymore. I just want to uh, quickly skip over. And as uh, an enthusiast talking about, uh, you know, drug discovery from plants, how could I lag behind not talking about algae as well? That being my domain. So marine algae uh, may hold key to preventing spread of COVID-19. Scientists using algae to produce low-cost COVID-19 test kits. These are all possible ways and methods and research avenues that have you know, sprung up uh, in recent times. 
and in conclusion the estimates of the world economic forum uh, over 50% of modern drugs developed from natural plant extracts uh, it's a biodiversity is a natural repository large number of covid-19 like disease outbreaks are zoonotic and spill spillover uh, events are primarily caused by ecological damage changing land use patterns deforestation the same things that have led us into the current situation of the sixth extinction and uh, you know the, the covid-19 situation is also an aftermath or a spillover of uh, that kind of instability that uh, you know is happening all over the world it's with the people are witnessing all over the world now as uh, my concluding remarks i would like to emphasize that solutions are truly in nature nature prevents and responds to some of the most pressing challenges faced by humans humans today and the emergence of covid-19 has underscored the fact that we when we destroy biodiversity we destroy the system that supports human life when we destroy biodiversity when we destroy the ecosystem the ecology of a place we are Uh, taking ourselves to a to a you know point of no return and human actions including deforestation and encroachment on wildlife habitat intensified agriculture acceleration of climate change these all of them upset the delicate balance of nature and we have changed the system that would naturally protect us with the lockdown in place emissions decreased air and water uh, getting more cleaner degrading habitats getting restored to some extent uh, and uh, you know we have realized that we really do not need so much in terms of consumption and that less is more than enough i think i would conclude with that line uh, thank you so much for giving me a patient hearing Sunit sir, thank you, Dr. Chen sir, for your very lucid lecture. During your lecture, I found number of questions, but as we are running short of time, hmm. so from there we just choose three questions for you. The first question, Saunaj Sheikh, Saunaj hmm. Sheikh of Vidya Sagar College. He asks, "Are the zoonotic diseases spread only from the wild animals, or from any other domesticated animals?" Uh, it is the skip. It's basically the jumping over of the disease uh, of of the pathogens. So it's not only always in the wild that it happens. It can, you know, get transferred from the, what I I have read uh, till date. It can uh, it uh, firstly initiated from the uh, wild. to the domesticated baby and then over to the uh, human beings or directly from the wild to the human beings so zoonotic diseases spread that way uh, was i audible thank you, yeah <laughs> thank you madam the second question asked by the kuram waksmali he asked are there dedicated indicators for sustainability to assess such or are the traditional indicators sufficient for assessment thereof what kind of sustainability was he talking about that Actually, has to be made clear first probably at the time the time of time of asking it means uh -huh. it is my prediction it's not his question uh, nothing is uh -huh. mentioned in his questions but uh -huh. when he asked his questions the time from that time i just uh, predicted that he asked about the biodiversity sustainability what about him just talking uh, regarding the budget funding or like that in that time okay 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 fine yeah questions. yeah 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 sure uh, it is not only the traditional uh, indicators that are working on this we have numerous indicators that measure sustainability at this point of time and uh, biodiversity economics has emerged as a very important sphere of study so there are many indicators which rely on economics on social socio political systems uh, which measure sustainability issues so it's not only the traditional system traditional systems definitely uh, give a boost to the understanding of the sustainability index but there exist many in terms of economics also biodiversity economics
And any more? Last but not least, the third yes. question. Asked yes. Asked by Dr. Shubhuti Bandopadhyay, uh, yes. Assistant Professor Narasimha Doctor College. He just asked about uh, question on the speciation. He's uh, asking is speciation is a continuous process. So many yes. new species of microbes, plants, and animals are reported in the last decades. Yes, What's sure. About your comment over this. It it is definitely happening. It is definitely happening, uh, especially in the marine system. We all know that it's a continuous process. Uh, speciation keeps on occurring, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, along with this uh, slow and steady process of evolution, where speciation takes place, extinctions takes place. Uh, we also have to adhere to the or have to accept the idea of catastrophic changes also. that was the idea behind all those uh, things that i was saying it's not it's of course it's definitely a slow and steady process uh, just like uh, i mean if i adhere to um, sir charles darwin's process as he uh, said but then there are catastrophic events also we have to take note of them also and uh, what happened in uh, times before human being came into existence uh, were basically those catastrophic events uh, Uh, the, the the sixth extinction that we are seeing is a steady way of you know things going berserk the one that uh, dr bontopadhyay has been asking so it's uh, speciation is happening extinctions are happening both at the uh, slow rate uh, as well as the way they happened in the five mass extinctions so uh, both of them are happening or can happen and as uh, professor uh, dr duwari was also telling that every uh, situation is a you know it's a chance situations that we are living in so we cannot rule out that also i think uh, that answers the question i'll talk to dr bontopadhyay about it later on then <laughs> Okay. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shinshadar, for your valuable yes. speech, which not yeah. only enriched us, all of us, but also provides a new light of thinking to our new generations and opens new vistas for research for our new generations. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you, Madam, once again. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, our second speaker is Dr. Basant Kumar Singh. Yes, yeah. sir. What? Assistant. What is the assistant? AGCG IBG. Now I request my colleague Dr. Dhruvo Das to introduce Dr. Basant Singh. I am thankful to Dr. Basant Singh for his positive attitude to accept our invitation, in spite of his busy schedule work of rebuilding and recovering the plant wealth of the Amphan affected Indian Botanic Garden. He positively. Accept our proposal. Thank you, Boston Kumar Sir. Dr. Dhrubodash, please introduce Dr. Boston. Yeah. Dhrubodash, yeah. can you hear me? Hello. 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 फोन कर
கொள்ளலாம் ஹலோ ஹலோ it is a great to to you but no longer it because but the efficiency is our body assistant of the ghost indian body Specialization in plant and food. We have it. Yes, the autonomic. We can break as a result. We have learned from Bhagwan University. He participated in the putting trip. He is a and then how the the lot is more than it is a international peer review this is the process in of a to conservation of our eating plants and introduction of mangroves in ac bosch india botanic garden and gis phyto mapping of trees in atadawi shadobosh indian botanic garden we will uh, reach by his precious lecture so requesting to dr vasan kumar shin for delivering his lecture please sir thank you dr dhuva good evening to all the participants i first i'd like to thank the organizing committee of this webinar uh, i would like to thank uh, principal sir and especially dr sumit mitra sir to giving me this opportunity to talk before uh, this group of scholars i think in this situation of pandemic covid 19 this is the best way to organize a webinar that will reduce a lot of carbon footprint 
as well as n number of scholars will be benefited uh, since yesterday i am seeing that lot of people are associated with the this platform through the youtube so they are getting benefited uh, the topic of this webinar is also very much relevant life in the universe and diversity so it is very essential to look back that what is the position of the biodiversity in the world how we came into existence and what will be our future and what dr dwari sir told yesterday what dr neela sen sarkar told today is very relevant so i want to start my uh, talk just where dr neela sen sarkar left it is the conservation uh, just i will take a moment to share the ppt and here it comes so the topic for today's uh, discussion uh, i selected like role of botanic garden in plant conservation with a special reference to ajc bose indian botany garden howra actually when we talk about biodiversity the need of conservation is quite obvious and very much essential so let us first start with the basic concept that what is a botanic garden as per the wise jackson's definition botanic gardens are institutions holding documented collections of living plants for the purpose of scientific research conservation display and education the definition itself highlights the four basic objective of a botanic garden if we summarize it comes the first objective as conservation the second one is the scientific research third one is education and fourth one is display or amusement for the general people so these are the four basic objective of any botany garden in the world if we go further then there are some important characteristics as defined by iucn garden conservation secretariat for a botany garden the first and most important the degree of permanence that means it should last for a long time that is the most important part when we talk about conservation or ex situ conservation the place should be permanently demarcated for that purpose the second a scientific basis for the collection this is the correct this characteristic differentiate a botanic garden from a park from a amusement garden or from an amusement place because in botanic garden there is always a scientific basis the third and most important is the proper documentation of the collection including the origin or even from where they were introduced which time which year they were introduced all information should be documented then monitoring of the plant collection leveling of the plants it should be open to the public so people can come and get aware then there should be a collaboration with other gardens other institutions uh, in context of the management in context context of knowledge sharing there should be an exchange seed exchange program uh, material exchange program at the same time parallelly there should be a scientific and technical research program on plant taxonomy or on the different aspects like phenology multiplication should go side by side so these are the major characteristics a botanic garden should have now if we go back into history i just want to discuss because botanic garden is not a very recent concept it all started long back during the early part of the 16th century that time the concept was little bit different though they were botanic garden but the purpose was only to include only to bring plants from the neighborhoods from the distant localities from the far away countries so that was the target that how many plants a botanic garden is having that was the main purpose in the next stage of evolution of botanic garden was the study of systematic botany or taxonomy that time a little bit of research was associated with the concept of development of botanic garden and the next stage in the advancement of the botanic garden three purpose three roles three objectives were addressed the first one was the comparative study of plants in a garden that is called the modern taxonomy experimental botany the second purpose was as a center of study of economic plants because that was a very important turning point for a botanic garden when uh, the 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 people started introducing the plants with economic importance so botanic garden were assessed with the uh, the holding of economic and the third most important stage was the horticultural research how we can improve a variety of the plant 
how can we introduce a uh, good number of wild relatives of a plant so a good gene can be extracted out of that so these are the evolutionary line and lines through which the concept of botany garden uh, came into the present scenario now we have introduced some new concept in the botany garden that is the conservation aspect conservation in the sense of especially we are focusing on the rare threatened endangered and endemic plant species at the same time the economically important plants so that is the totally new concept which is now quite exhibited by all the important botanic gardens in the world now these are the nine facets of aim or objective uh, that is behind a botanic garden serve as a living repository for plants to serve as a safe abode for the rare endemic species to house the germplasm collections of selected economic and ornamental plants to promote educational programs and research in experimental ornamental horticulture to undertake research on propagation of rare threatened species and species for afforestation energy alternative substitute food fodder plants to generate awareness about value of trees and about curious beautiful interesting plants to organize flower foliage plant so exchange of viable seeds to introduce economic and commercially exploitable species to act as data bank for information and documentation holdings in botanic garden so these are the nine important facets uh, which a botanic garden is now uh, following now the some basic concepts are there that how we can make a botanic garden or which garden can be defined as a botanic garden so there are some parameters most of the botanic gardens in the world the size of the garden is very important on an average if we go through the important gardens in the world it is bit, it is up to 175 hectares 100 to 175 hectares even more bigger size are good so you can accommodate different types of sections in that botany garden the second the soil condition it should be fertile so it can host a large number of plants from different habitat then there should be a perennial source of water and at least 10% of the total area should be water surface so you can introduce different type of aquatic plants then it comes that botanic garden there should be a planning for the different type of sections like taxonomic garden medicinal plant garden germplasm collection arboretum so these are the different type of plants that you can uh, put in different sections in a botanic garden should be some articulturally uh, architecturally attractive glass houses conservatories plant ho plant houses to grow different type of rare endangered species then there should be a different type of monuments for aesthetic beauty uh, plant houses ornamental gardens etc especially for the to attract the publics then it should be quite near uh, not very far from the town so the accessibility should be there because the purpose is to attract the visitors attract the researchers the students so accessibility is a very important factor in case of a botanic garden then there should be a well equipped laboratory to carry out the research work especially on the, the seed germination on the taxonomy on the phenology and finally a residential accommodation for the garden management staff because that is also important because if the staffs are staying away from the garden so the management will be a challenge so most of the gardens they try to keep their staff either inside the garden or in the vicinity of the garden so these are the requirements of a botanic garden now if we go through the important botanic gardens in the world in chronological order we find that the botanic garden in padua italy was established in 1544 and considered as the oldest botanic garden in the world and in that chronological order the ajc bose indian botanic garden howra comes on the sixth position which was which was established in 1787 so at present our garden is approximately 232 to 33 years old so this much old botany garden we have in our country so let us start with uh, botany garden acharya jagdish chandra bose indian botany garden uh, with its special features how it is related with the conservation of plants now it is a brief outline or you can say the brief introduction for the botanic garden actually this acharya jagdish chandra bose indian botany garden is one of the oldest and perhaps the biggest botanic garden in southeast asia actually when this garden was established in 1787 the total area was 300 acres and that was the biggest in the world uh, because kew botany garden when it was started it was smaller than 
the AJC both Indian Botany Garden, later some extra areas were added in that garden and now it is the biggest one. The second most important thing at present, the, the area of the garden, 270 acre, which is located on the west bank of river Hooghly. And the garden is known for its historical introduction of many commercial plants and had influenced the socio-economic condition of India. I will explain with example that how it affected the socio-economic condition of India. The third important part is that presently this garden is working as a pioneer exit to conservation site and a plant research center and is an adorb of a variety of plant species introduced from all across the world. So if you come to the garden, you will find a miniature world flora, plants introduced from Africa, plants introduced from Australia, America, and the different continents, different part of the world, because it was established by the colonial people, and they had the opportunity to introduce the plant from the, all across the world. As the garden is, I told the one of the oldest botany garden, the time when it was established, the country was ruled by the British, the colonial rule, East India Company was ruling our country. So there is an interesting history, there is an interesting background with the establishment of these garden, this botany garden. There, are, there were four main factors that led to the establishment of this garden. It is quite obvious, uh, all students who have learned history during their uh, school level, they know that East India, uh, East India Company came to our country only for the business purpose. The motto was not to develop a botany garden or a develop a platform for research. So obviously, the background was little different. The first important reason was that during the 1769, 1770s, and then again 1784, there were serious famines in Bengal and some part of the uh, East and North India. That was a very important factor because there was a huge scarcity of food. Second factor was that during the Van Reed period, when he worked during the 1667 in the Malabar coast, and he documented the plant wealth of that area, especially the southern India, the British people found some interesting, economically important plants growing in India. So an interest for to know the, the, the entire biodiversity of this country grew among the, the scientific fraternity of Great Britain. And after that, the first professional botanist under East India Company during 1780s, who also worked on the floristic diversity of this country. And when they sent their reports to the Great Britain, the scientists there were very much interested to know in details about the floristic diversity of this country. Finally, when Colonel Robert Keyes, though, though he was not a botanist or nothing to do with the botany, and an amateur interest in, uh, he had an amateur interest in plant uh, science, especially the uh, growing the different type of plants. He developed his own garden in Salimar, and he was the key person who sent two proposals to the British government for this the establishment of this uh, botany garden. The first proposal was forwarded by Warren Hastings, then the Governor General of India, and the second proposal was forwarded by the Lord Cornwallis. These two people were quite influential and they had a good hold over the decision on policy making things of East India Company. And finally, it was supported by uh, Joseph Bank, Sir Joseph Bank, who was looking after the financial part of the establish botanical establishment in England. And finally, on 6 July 1787, the proposal to establish a botany garden was approved, and this AJC goes in the botany garden took birth on 6th July. Now, let us go uh, through the establishment history very briefly. As I told, Colonel Kidd was the founder of this garden, so he became the first honorary superintendent of this garden from 1787 to 1793. And at that time, the garden was known as Company Bagan, or the Company Garden. After the retirement of Colonel Kidd, William Roxburgh joined as a, the first salaried superintendent who was who continues his service in this garden for 21 long years from 1793 to 1814. During his period, he explored the floristic diversity of this country. He tried to introduce as much as species he could accommodate in the garden. And he was the first person who thoroughly studied the diversity, floristic plant diversity of this country. And for that reason, he was considered as the father of Indian botany. 
so by profession though he was a surgeon but he has his interest in plant kingdom and later he become a a, a, a pioneer plant taxonomist and he is honored as the father of indian taxonomy so during his time there is a turning point from the commercial use of this garden to the taxonomical use or to the research use later words lot of important taxonomist plant scientists worked in this garden and there were lot of important turning points happened in the history of this botany garden uh, if we talk about nathaniel walich he was the person who helped actually he helped the lord bishop of calcutta in 1820 to develop the first ia the, the engineering college in bengal uh, presently known as the engineering institute of science and technology iiest sipur that time he donated 40 acres of land from garden to lord bishop of calcutta and during his tenure only the introduction of tea cultivation took place in india first time in this garden in 1857 during the superintendency of thomas thompson the garden was transferred to the british government and in 1858 the company bagan was renamed as royal botany garden during the tenure of george king during 1871 to 1897 he did, did a marvelous job in landscaping the entire garden he dig out 24 artificial lakes and use the soil for making the mounds so there was you can say that there was an he added the beauty with the conservation concept with the scientific research concept and for that reason only he was awarded with the knighthood during the tenure of david prain uh, he gave the proposal to lay out the garden into 25 divisions so at present we are having 25 divisions in the garden that represents the different phytogeographical region of the world kp viswas was the first indian superintendent during 1937 to 1955 in his tenure the royal botany garden as india got independence and the royal botany garden became the indian botany garden in 1963 the indian botany garden became a part of botanical survey of india and its control was transferred from provincial provincial government to the central government and finally the recent development on 24 june 2009 the garden was again renamed as acharya jagdish chandra bose indian botany garden after a renowned plant scientist from west bengal acharya jagdish and professor acharya jagdish chandra bose so this is the history how the garden has changed how the major uh, events happened in the history of garden now i told that this garden has played a significant role in some historical introduction that has changed the socio economic condition of our country and these are a few examples Uh, the first introduction in our country took place in the garden the purpose of the garden as i told after the the great famine in west bengal in bengal was to introduce some economically important plant for acclimatization or for the experimental purpose so uh, later words it can be commercial grown in the other parts of the country very important was the tea cultivation the tea was first time introduced during the roxburgh period say something about uh, between 1795 or 1814 Uh, from the china uh, before that tea was exclusively cultivated in china only and china had the monopoly over the tea export and earning lot of revenue so british government wanted to break that monopoly they took that opportunity they introduced the tea cultivation first time in india in this botany garden later a native tea species was discovered by robert bruce in 1823 from assam some part of assam afterwards in during the 1834 Francis Jenkins made large scale trial of tea cultivation in the garden so the tea which now the india is considered as an exporting country for tea we are having so many world famous teas like assam tea darjeeling tea but the starting point of the tea took place in this ajc bose indian botanic garden some 200 years back so that is a very important uh, introduction in the garden similarly cinchona was introduced from the south africa and uh, that that is also a very important medicinal plant because during that time uh, this malaria was quite pandemic lot of people were dying out of malaria so british government took this uh, uh, opportunity to introduce cinchona plantation and that also took place first time in the garden by the intervention of thomas anderson during 1861 but due to the environmental condition in calcutta it was not that much successful so later it it was it was taken to darjeeling the mampu in darjeeling and uh, the nilgiris in south india but the introduction took first time took place in this botany garden similarly the rubber cultivation was introduced first time introduced in 1873 when sir george king 
uh, brought some seeds of heavier Brazilians is the para rubber given by Sir J.D. Hooker and that was also first time produced in Botany Garden. Another economically important plant, the mahogany, a high good quality, high value timber yielding plant that is a native of West Indies, was introduced in this garden during the period of William Roxburgh in 1795. Still we have an avenue that is more than 200 years old, first time established in this garden. Uh, so that is the starting point of the cultivation of mahogany. At present, you will find this mahogany cultivation throughout the India. Some many universities, they are having this mahogany as their avenue plantation. But the starting point is with the garden only. Other than these plants, some interesting, some beautiful ornamental plants were also introduced first time in this garden uh, by the different uh, scientists, different taxonomists like Amarcia nobilis, which is considered as the queen of flowering trees, is a native of Burma, which was introduced by Nathaniel Walich during 1826. The Alamanda Bougainvillea by Hamilton in 1803, then the garden croton, a very popular garden plant in 1798 by Smith, then Victoria Amazonica, a very important, interesting plant that we have in our garden that is popularly known as giant water lily and the double coconut. These were introduced by George King during 1874 and 1873 and 1874. Chinese rose that hibiscus was introduced in 1794 by William Roxburgh. Not only these, but other economical spice species like cardamom, cinnamon, cinchona, coffee, cotton, indigo, nutmeg, paper, cloves, sugarcane, potatoes, so sago tea. These were also first time introduced, either their varieties, their wild relatives for the hybridization program. They were first started in this botanic garden. So this botanic garden from historical point of view has a very important role in the Indian history. This is the map of the 273-acre AJC Bose Indian Botany Garden located on the, situated on the west bank of River Rugli. Uh, you can see the, the divisions. As I told that during the tenure of uh, David Crane, the entire garden for the management purpose divided into 25 divisions, uh, starting from division 1 to division 25. And each represent a typical phytogeographical region of the world. Means the planning was that when some plant will be introduced in this garden, it will in a particular division. Say the division one represents the Vietnam, Malaya and Thailand species. So during the British rule, even after independence also, the trend was there to introduce plants from the different continents, different countries. And for that reason, only the garden is considered as a miniature world flora. So you will find that a lot of this uh, road network is there just for information. The total road network, the total road length is approximately 17 five kilometers so that much large this botany garden is there are 24 artificially built lakes uh, dig out during the time of george king all the lakes are interconnected and just to maintain the moisture in the soil all the lakes are interconnected and finally connected to the river hubi through two swiss gates the concept was that when there will be high tide the fresh water will come inside that is it will just charge all the lakes in the garden and when there will be high tide the water will go outside up to a certain level and it will be operated. That time it was operated by steam engine, uh, the Swiss gates. After that, now it is automatic Swiss gates. So that was the drainage pattern uh, conceived by the British scientists and still it is functional. So we are able to maintain a variety of plants from a variety of habitats in this botany garden. So at present, we are having approximately or more than 14,000 trees and shrubs belonging to 1,377 species altogether as per the latest uh, published census and uh, more than 500 herbaceous plants growing in different divisions. We are having exclusive collections of bamboos in our bamboo setum, bougainvilleas, then citrus, jasmines, pandanus, there is a richest collection of palm species in our garden that is represented by 109 palm species. We are having a separate section for succulents with 100 species. Then aromatic plant section is there. Then one pinetum is there for the gymnosperms. So in that way, the entire garden is an assemblage of different type of sections, different type of plants, just to benefit the research, benefit the public awareness, the students, and the most important is the conservation. This is the large palm house, an exclusive collection of more than 100 palm species produced from the neighboring countries as well as the endemic species of our country. So this is a very important uh, uh, section of our garden which was built in 1854. 
and uh, it houses a lot of important uh, palm species. Uh, this is the glass house or cactus house for succulents. So here we are having more than 100 species of succulents. Then there is a Charakudyan exclusively for the medicinal plant. Here also we are having more than 300 medicinal important plant species and mostly used uh, for, the, uh, for the awareness program for schools and college students. And uh, uh, this year uh, we introduced a new section, a uh, new rosarium that is having uh, more than uh, 450 varieties of rose. There are 2,700 plants belonging to uh, 250 varieties of rose. This year it was, uh, uh, this section was open for the public. And uh, a newly developed aromatic plant garden is also, uh, now uh, we are introducing the different aromatic plant species from all over India. We are just collecting the plant species and introducing. So this is also a new section in our garden. And one very important ambitious project uh, is un now under process by the Botanical Survey of India by this garden. The introduction of an uh, entire mangrove section along the Ganges. Last year, we introduced 2,100 mangrove saplings. This year, another more thousand species, uh, thousand plants of mangroves we are introducing. So there will be altogether more than 3,000 3, mangrove plants along the Ganges. So the purpose we are developing this section, the first, the most important is the plant conservation. The second one is the beautification of the river bank. The third, the protection of the river bank from soil erosion or soil decaying. And fourth is the public awareness, because a lot of people from different parts of the country, they are coming, if they want to see how mangrove looks like, or what is the adaptation, mangrove adaptation, salinity, uh, the adaptation taking place in the mangrove plants, so that they can see in this, this particular section. So this is a new introduction in the garden. At the same time, there is a research center, we call it Central National Herbarium, and it is a repository of more than 2 million plant specimens from you can say that throughout the world, other countries' specimens are also here. And for India, it is covering all the states. So this is a very important research station where the researchers from all across the world come for research activities. So this is also part earlier. It started in the garden. Now it is a separate unit working under Botanical Survey of India. Now this is the history production. Uh, in terms of the number of species, we mainly focused on the rare, threatened, endemic, and some economically important species. Uh, you will find that more, hundred, uh, more than 900 plant species are introduced since 2010 in, uh, up to 2020. And uh, firstly, they are kept in the nursery for acclimatization because whenever we are bringing plant from uh, any protected area, different habitat, the plant needs some time to get acclimatized in this West Bengal climatic condition. So for say two or three years or four years, we keep them in the nurseries for acclimatization in different greenhouses, in conservatories. And after that, we introduce them, we transplant them in their respective divisions as per their distribution and importance. So these are the, uh, the things we are just multiplying the different plants. Recently, we started the uh, experiment on the seed germination of the Baobab, the Adansonia digitata, and then the propagation of Emersia nobilis that uh, uh, queens of flower, then mad tree, and other uh, important uh, RET species we are multiplying. Uh, so these are the some of the important species recently introduced in the garden, uh, like Esculus asamica is an endemic species from Northeast. Then there is uh, Rophalloblastia augusta, endemic species from the uh, Nicobar Islands. And uh, these are also the different uh, economically important and uh, endemic species or threatened species like Coryfa teliara is one interesting palm. Uh, which is uh, at present, which is considered as extinct from wild. So we, in our garden, we are having a uh, few uh, living representatives. So researchers are going on on the uh, tissue culture propagation of this particular species. Then we are having Cygeum travancoricum uh, from the Western Ghats, that is an endemic species. Then Gymnema khandalensis, an exclusively endemic species of uh, Maharashtra and a threatened species. So in that way, we are having this uh, Bentikia nicobarica, an endemic species from Nicobar Islands. Insecta superbum, that is called stone banana, that is also endemic species of Western Ghat, especially in Maharashtra and Kerala area, it is growing. So such kind of endemic, rare, threatened, and economically important plant species we are introducing in the garden. We are nurturing them, we are caring them. Because in basic concept, we can understand that this is the original copy that we have to conserve. So in future, if they get extinct from wild for any reason, 
lot of reasons are there. Uh, Nina Madam was talking about the climate change, global warming, anthropological pressure is there. So if for any chance, if it get extinct from the wild, so we will have a copy in our garden. And from there, with the exit to conservation concept, we can multiply it and we can just return it back to the wild. This is the purpose of the conservation in this garden. Now, regarding some interesting plant of our garden, as a lot of students have joined through uh, YouTube, as this year, I think garden, I don't know when it will open for public. So uh, last year, we had a lot of students during this time, but this year, none, none of them visited. So just I want to share some of the important, interesting plants that we have in our garden. The most important, the most cherished plant is the great banyan tree. We considered it as the senior most citizen of our garden, a 270 years old banyan tree, which is standing, uh, which has witnessed a lot of historical events uh, in its lifetime. And a lot of interesting facts are associated with this garden, this, this, uh, this banyan tree. This tree is considered as one of the biggest tree in the world. Uh, it is included in the Guinness Book, uh, Guinness Book of World Record for the biggest canopy in the world. Uh, the total canopy area is approximately 1.6 hectare. And it is supported by uh, more than 4,000 prop roots. That is also a kind of, you can say, natural wonder. The most interesting part is that this tree doesn't have its main trunk because in 1925, the main trunk was removed after a severe fungal infection. So since 1925, this tree is survived and growing with the help of all its prop roots. And every year, on an average, 100 prop roots are getting added to this old tree. And still it is growing. Uh, so sometimes it is also referred as the walking tree of Indian Botany Garden because though trees do not walk, but in some sense, it is walking with the help of its prop roots. It is just uh, proceeding towards a certain direction. So popularly it is known as the walking tree of the Indian Botany Garden or one seeded forest of Indian Botany Garden. So this is the this is the tree which attracts most of the visitors throughout the year. Uh, then comes the another very important, very interesting conserved species, the only living representative of our country, the double coconut. Scientist is known as Lodicea Maldivica, which was introduced in 1894 from the Sicils Island. This tree is considered as one of the highly threatened and endemic species in the world because it is found, it, is, it grows only on the Sicils Island and in some of the botany gardens it was introduced and it is totally endemic on the Sicils Island. In 1894, this tree was introduced in our botany garden. There are some interesting facts, some records with, associated with this tree. I want to share the first important record is it bears the heaviest and biggest seed known to science. A single seed weigh around 25 to 30 kilograms. Just consider a coconut weighing around 25 to 30 kg. Because whatever coconut that Cocos nucifera we use for the domestic purpose is hardly 500 gram or hardly one kilogram like that. But this double coconut, the total weight of a seed is approximately 25 to 30 kg. And that is a world record. The second world record is that among the palm, it survives for the longest period. That means its total lifespan is approximately 1000 years or 1200 years like that. The third world record, among the palm, it bears the biggest leaf. A single leaf measures around 1, 1 1.5 meter in diameter. So these are the three world records. Now, there are some interesting facts, morphological characteristics associated with this plant that I also I want to share because there is a related story with that that I will share. The first important thing is that this palm is a diocese species. Diocese means male plant, the male flowers born on a different plant, the female on a different plant. So when this tree was introduced in 1894 to this garden as a small sapling, Scientists were not knowing the sex of the plant because in case of plant, you cannot determine the sex. So when the plant was introduced, scientists were not knowing the sex. Second interesting characteristics, uh, characteristic is that the first flowering takes place approximately after 100 years. So after 100 years of its plantation, then scientists came to know that this is a female tree. 
So the challenge was how to pollinate this because in our country we had a single tree. So we started searching in the neighboring countries, in the botany gardens of the neighboring countries, and we found that in the Paradinia Botany Garden, Sri Lanka, and Nongmuch Botany, Botany Garden, Thailand, some male trees are growing and they were in the flowering condition. So at the beginning, when we received some pollen grain from the Nongmuch Botany Garden, Thailand, and from Paradinia Botany Garden, Sri Lanka, it took six years time to our scientists to actually pinpoint the timing of pollination because pollination is a complex chemistry. Every plant, plant has different pollination times and it is very much dependent upon the different environment, uh, environmental conditions, different factors, depends upon temperature, moisture, many things, many factors are there. So it took six years time to our scientists to exactly pinpoint uh, the timing of pollination. And finally, in 2013, the pollination, the successful pollination took place and that we assured when we found that the fruit size started increasing. So that was an important turning point. First time in India, such kind of trans-border pollination was carried out. We coined the term trans-border pollination because, because the pollen was collected from a different country and then the female uh, flower was inseminated in our country. So it's a kind of trans-border pollination. Then there are some, again, interesting facts that the fruit takes six to seven years time for its maturity. So the pollination, successful pollination took place in 2013 and finally the fruit here only we harvested two mature fruits in the month of February. We were lucky just before the lockdown, commencement of the lockdown, we harvested the two mature fruits. Uh, the bigger one was weighing around 15 kg and the second one was weighing around some uh, just less than 10 kg it is around 9.5 uh, 500 gram like that uh, as this is not its native place so maybe the reason why the fruit didn't achieve the 25 kg or 30 kg uh, weight but still we are hopeful that with those two fruits we can start the next generation but again there is a turning point there is a twist in the story there is a dormancy period and it lasts up to 10 years. That means 10 years we have to keep these fruits safely from it, uh, different types of pests, insects, or any kind of contamination or infection. And after 10 years, it will take another two and a half years, 2.5 years for germination. So all together, it is a matter of 12 to 13 years when a new plant or germination will take place. And we are hopeful that if we get two male plants out of that, so in future, we have not to borrow, we have not to ask for the pollen from the other countries. We will be self-capable of pollinating uh, the mother plant with the next progeny. But whether it will be a male or female, we will, we will know only after the 100 years when it will flower again. So that was the interesting history behind this uh, double coconut, the only representative, living representative of our country. And uh, it is nicely conserved in our botany garden. Uh, so this is the fruit when it started developing. And uh, these are the seeds. You can see that the, why it is called double coconut because the seed looks like two coconuts fused together. So it is a bilobed structure. And in the earlier days, the half portion of the seed was used as kamandal by the sadhu babas and that time there were a lot of myths that if you keep the seed in your house, it will bring some good uh, fortune. Uh, so the, the worthy peoples, so the kings were purchasing uh, from the merchants, uh, this seed giving equal amount of gold, but it was simply a myth. And very soon they realized that it is not giving any kind of wealth, but simply taking their wealth in the form of gold. So it was discontinued. But from the conservation point of view, the, the, this particular species is still important lot of botany gardens, they are trying to conserve, they are trying to propagate this particular species. So this was the fruit when it was harvested uh, in the month of February. Now the another species introduced uh, during the period of George King, uh, this is called the giant water lily. We are having two species, the Victoria Amazonica and then Victoria Cruziana. These are also considered as the biggest uh, water plants uh, in the world. Uh, because the leaf size is quite gigantic. A single leaf size measure about uh, around 1, 1. 1.5 meter in diameter. In the balance, it, it, it provides a good buoyancy. So it can hold a weight up to 70 kg. Uh, 
uh, just to prove that I put my daughter some three years back on uh, one of the leaf. Uh, she was only uh, that time she was only 14, 15 kg like that. But still, it uh, nicely it can hold. And we uh, in his uh, some few years back we experimented with two three children. I didn't get that photographs to share with you, but uh, it can uh, hold a weight of uh, two three children uh, like her. So that is the special attraction of our garden. But the, as this is an annual plant, uh, you find this plant in the, this uh, the full grown stage only during the month of September October up to November because after December uh, we have to collect the seeds for the next. Uh, season which is which starts uh, during the month of june already we have uh, started germinating the seeds for uh, introducing different lakes of our garden then this this is uh, called the branched palm this is also a very important uh, species of our garden it was introduced from africa and this is the characteristic typical characteristic because branching doesn't occur in case of uh, palm species but this particular species, Hyphenet habica, so such kind of bifurcated branching, dichotomous branching. And now it is very much acclimatized in the Indian climate. And now we have distributed through a lot of universities, research institutions, even for avenue plantation, uh, even you find it growing in Goa coastal areas. So it is nicely growing and a very interesting species uh, that people want to see. So very important interest that uh, people come and see this in the garden. And then the Kalpavishha, the Bawa tree, a lot of myths are there. Uh, it is also popularly known as the wish tree uh, because there is a myth that whatever wish you have, if you touch and ask the wish, that will be fulfilled. Uh, so a lot of people, they are just encouraging that myth. They are coming, they are just worshipping this tree. But from scientific point of view, we cannot uh, justify that myth. But from medicinal point of view, this is a very important plant, a native of Africa, the western part of Africa. This is a, a kind of xerophytic plant, a succulent plant that stores a lot of water in its main trunk and that water is potable water. And the tribal people in Africa, they are very much dependent upon this tree when they go for hunting because if they don't get any water source, they make a hole in the main trunk, water comes out and they take that water for their survival. So for them, it is a kind saving tree and they worship this tree for that purpose it is medicinally very important the bark the leaves the flowers the fruits are having different type of uh, minerals amino acids the building block of protein at the same time the flowers are considered as a cure for female infertility so in the africa also as well as in india also wherever this tree these trees are growing Uh, prescribing the female the flowers for curing the female infertility and that may be the reason why it is called kalpa viksha because somehow it is helping regenerating the life uh, getting the life in our garden we are having a fully mature tree more than 100 years old but in this amphan it, it got destroyed not destroyed it's totally uprooted and now we are planning to restore it because it is a very important species we have and as it is very old we don't want to lose it, it in any way uh, then we are having this pitcher plant, the Nepenthes khasiana introduced from uh, Northeast India. This is one of example of the insectivorous plant. Uh, that is also uh, we have in our garden and very much liked by the school students. And then stone banana, as I already told, uh, this is an endemic species of Western Ghat. It, this is also a medicinal plant. Uh, the fruit is used for curing the stomach troubles. And uh, it is found only in the Western Ghats. So some uh, 20, 30 years back, it was introduced in the garden. And now it is nicely propagating. And we are just uh, providing to different research institutions also for carry out different type of researches. Uh, then this is called the Napoleon hat. Uh, the, due to this flower shape, it is called Napoleon hat, uh, a curious plant. Then this is also a very interesting species called uh, mangrove gymnosperm, Taxodium gysticum. This is also perhaps the only living plant in our country introduced from America. This is a kind of gymnosperm which, which grows in the mangrove areas. So it has the nematophores. Uh, still, uh, we didn't get any flowering stage of this particular tree, but we are trying to multiply it with uh, different techniques like cuttings and layering. And this is the African nutmeg, or also known as the orchid tree. 
monodora grandiflora we have in our garden and uh, we are multiplying this particular tree the flowers are very beautiful then this is amarsia nobilis the dancing doll tree or the queen of flower this is considered one of the 10 most beautiful flower in the world uh, it, it was introduced from burma uh, during the time of uh, george king and uh, this was also uh, nathaniel wallis during the period of nathaniel wallis uh, this is also very uh, an important attraction for the visitors it flowers during the month of january february uh, this is also IUCN red listed plant. This one is that brownia, mountain rose, Venezuelan rose. Uh, this is this also bears beautiful flowers introduced from Venezuela. And this is Krishna what? Ficus krishnai. Uh, this particular plant uh, again has some uh, mythological connections, some mythological stories are there. Uh, why it is called Krishna what? The reason is that there is a cup like structure at the ba base of the leaf. And uh, the myth says that Lord Krishna used to hide butter in these cups. Uh, so whenever just uh, Mata Jashoda was asking that whether you have uh, taken away the uh, butter, so he was hiding it, putting the front side in front of mother. So uh, in that way, the name Krishna, what Krishna is associated with this particular species, and it is plentifully growing in the Vrindavan and Mathura area. In our garden, we are having two mature trees, and now we are multiplying it and giving to different organizations to popularize this particular species. Uh, this is a species of ficus only, that uh, our, the banyan, uh, banyan species. So these were all about the, some interesting, curious plant that we have in our garden. Now, this is the devastation. As Neera Madam told that in our garden also, we lost a lot of trees. More than 300 trees are totally destroyed by uprooting and more than 1,000 trees are damaged in any way, either by the broken branches or they have just broken from the mid. So this is the devastation. Is the top left. Uh, you will find the bower tree lying on the ground, a wish tree which has fulfilled the wish of a lot of people uh, now just waiting for our uh, uh, restoration program. And this is the bamboo setum of the garden which has lost a lot of bamboos plants and then this is the part of banyan tree these two uh, photographs represents the damage uh, occurred in the banyan tree and the other important plant species that we lost important plants we lost in ampan but uh, these are the natural calamities uh, very little we can do for all these things but what we can do is the post ampan restoration program that is already under process uh, we have engaged our manpower the machinery the cranes are utilized for just uplifting the plant, erecting the plants, restoring the plants as far as possible. And where we are unable to restore them, uh, then we are just planting the, replanting the same species. And uh, we have to wait because uh, whatever we lost are more than 100 years old trees like that. So it will take time to get that maturity. So that, that, that is a big loss on the part of this botany garden. But still we are hopeful, we are trying our best to uh, multiply them as uh, much as possible. So this is the situation. This is the way how we are conserving the garden, conserving the different uh, RET species in the garden. So hope that uh, this uh, talk was helpful, especially to the students uh, uh, in the graduation level or the other scholars. Uh, so with these things, we just I want to just uh, end my talk. Uh, if you have any query, you are welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Sumit, sir. Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Vasan Singh, for your very interesting lecture. Sir, there is a lot of questions. Most of answers thank you, sir. For your lecture. Because sir. many question is about the condition of the garden just after the Ampan uh, cyclone. But your picture is self explanatory. What is the condition now the garden desert? One question on my half that is there is two terminology. There is two terminology, especially one is botanic garden and second is botanical garden. We generally used up with the name of a garden. What is the difference? Is there any organizational difference? between National Botanical Garden and Indian Botanical Garden? Uh, it's a very important question and very interesting also because... Uh, uh, 
botanical both has the same meaning and uh, robert kidd when established this garden in his proposal he used both the terms sometimes botanic garden sometimes botanical gardens so from the historical point of view both the terms were used for the same meaning but as per the use in uh, this al ending uh, cal cal ending for the different purposes we find that if it is botanic we can explain it exclusively for the research purpose for a conservation purpose that means there is some scientific thing the scientific objective is there and when it is cl cal ending is there that means botanical you will find that lot of examples are there some amusement some pleasure is associated with that i just want to give one example like we say music class a class where music will be taught so there is a kind of research or there is a kind of education and if we call musical chair the word is same but with the ending the concept has entirely changed musical chair is nothing but an amusement a game of amusement so uh, even our uh, last uh, uh, garden head dr uh, arvind pramanik has nicely explained the difference between these two terms botanic and botanical but uh, we are using in the standard form in the government department we are using the botanic only but in the internet you will find that a lot of this wikipedia and other sources they have mentioned botanical but in the standard form we are just continuing the word botanic garden so that much is the difference there is another question that there is some problem regarding the exotic species there is some problem regarding the exotic species and nowadays it is found that these exotic species it becomes invasive alliance species and it creates a lot of uh, problem to the local biodiversity uh, and on the point of you know, biodiversity conservation it is guided that we should eradicate this exotic species but is there any rule is there any rule to introduce this species in the botanic garden that means in foreign species in the botanic garden it's a question asked by dr subhash bandopadha uh, associate professor norish university college and shashwat mukherji that is a bank uh, department kolani mahavidyalay both of them asked this same question in different ways i just try to that is also very important in terms of what our is ajc bos in the botanic garden because this garden has a record of introducing lot of exotic species uh, that was introduced for the ornamental purpose but later uh, scientists realized that this become an uh, uh, noxious weed uh, an alien species uh, just for example this lantana camara was first time introduced in this botanic garden and uh, for horticultural purpose and later uh, uh, an alien species and uh, distributed throughout our country and now it is a very big management challenge uh, similarly other species also introduced in this garden presently we are not introducing any exotic species from other countries that is the thing after cbd uh, there is a restriction of introducing any species from other countries but yes we are introducing some indigenous that some endemic species or some native species of our own country from the different protected areas so at present uh, there is no such situation that any species is uh, um, means exotic species making some problem in case of this, uh, like an alien species and as such i don't know whether there is any guideline maybe some guidelines should be there i don't know about that because we are concentrating on this iucn red listed plants so at present the situation doesn't arise for any weed species that we are introducing in the garden so uh, 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 am i clear on this question actually last part of your answer is not audible to me i am sorry for that it's some instrument issue and problem is going on i think so Okay. 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 Somehow, I think Dr. Banerjee and uh, both Sarshad Mukherjee may get their answer. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for your invaluable. Thank you once again. I'm the other organizer. Thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank you.
বাসন স্যার মিউট করে রেখেছেন two days long national webinar and only one thing which i have to do is giving vote of thanks and then principal to functionally conclude end of our program now i just giving the vote of thanks on behalf of the organizer as a convener of this today's national seminar as everything has an end so we come to the end phase of this today's national webinar on life in the universe and diversity the discussions at the webinar has been lively analytical and illustrative i am sure that all participants especially the students and the researchers have been benefited and updated through the webinar which has just concluded i am greatly obliged and thankful to the all distinguished speakers i am thankful to all the participants of the webinar who have made it lively with their interactions and valuable suggestions our respected arupta the principal of my college gives us special thanks as he has motivated us mainly for this webinar i am thankful to dr umba nukarji the coordinator of the ipcc for his active participation let me convey my thanks to all my colleagues who did a lot to materialize this idea of the webinar by giving a shape and other supporting staff too last but not least i convey special thanks to sri tapas kundru and his team who has managed properly the whole webinar now let me draw a curtain over the webinar with a few words from our respected principal dr arup kumar maiki sir dr arup kumar maiki sir sir sunai jacche sir audio ta connect nahi hello principal sir audio ta फोन कर
স্যার যদি একবার লিফট করে জয়েন করেন তাও বেটার হয় আমি 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 না না স্যার অরূপ কুমার মাইতি স্যার হ্যাঁ হ্যাঁ বিশেষ করে অডিও কানেক্ট হচ্ছে হুম थैंकूल ओके एंड कोड छि ओके एंड कोड मारखाने सबो जो मारखाने रेडी है हेलो हां बसन सर किछ बोल छ हेलो बसन सर अनम्यूट कर ले ना ना थैंक्स फॉर जो नो कॉल आउट थैंक यू फॉर ऑर्गेनाइजिंग सच अ इंपोर्टेंट सेमिनार ओके ओके थैंक यू ओके 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 ए सुनित सर की बोल छ थैंक यू